Hello and welcome back, Biology 182 Lab students. Today we'll be discussing Lab 40A, which is on page 439 in your lab text. And we'll be talking about phyla echinodermata and hemichordata. Uh, your objectives for this lab are list echinoderm and hemichordate characteristics closely associated with successful food gathering and survival. Uh, number two, describe the morphology of organisms in echinodermata and hemichordata. Number three, list characteristics that echinoderms and hemichordates share with the phyla discussed previously. Number four, discuss characteristics of echinoderms and hemichordates that are unique or advanced compared to more primitive phyla. Number five, describe the water vascular system of echinoderms. Number six, uh, discuss the embryological characteristics that distinguish deuterostomes from protostomes. And number seven, understand which phyla are protostomes and which are deuterostomes. On our first slide here, we can take a look and see we have some sea stars that move via tube feet although their arms can bend slowly it isn't a fast process and the top right we see a brittle star which moves more like a traditional animal that uses legs that we're used to uh, via something like muscular contractions rather than just tube feet in the bottom left we see a sea urchin which moves uh, via tube feet and uses tube feet also to collect food and sense their surroundings. And in the bottom right is a sea lily, which is like a sea star but live more of a sessile lifestyle. In summary, echinoderms are a group of around 7,000 invertebrate marine bottom dwellers with spiny skin made of calcium carbonate it functions as an endoskeleton. These animals are closely related to the chordates and share with them the developmental trait of deuterostomy, which was conserved throughout the evolution of the last major lineage of animals. The kinoderms are united by their pentaradial symmetry, which means five-sided, a water vascular system for movement, somewhat like hydraulics, and an endoskeleton of bone-like plates called ossicles. They're dioecious, which means they're male and females, and reproduce sexually via external fertilization, although many can regenerate lost limbs, but cannot regenerate an entire individual. If you look up to the top right, echinoderms look simple, but are more complex than mollusks, annelids, and arthropods. And in the bottom right, we see a sea star with its tube feet, which are hydraulically operated, and spines. During your study of chapter 40, the phylum echinodermata, which means spiny skin, there are four questions I want you to keep in mind. Number one, how did the special morphological structures found in echinoderms help them survive in their environment? Number two, how does one differentiate the five classes of echinoderms? Number three, what ancestral characteristics do echinoderms share with the phyla? discussed previously. And number four, describe the water vascular system of echinoderms and what is it used for. And the five classes of echinoderms are distinguished primarily by the arrangement of their ossicles, not so much their appearance. The last major lineage of animals, the echinoderms and chordates, we look at the ancestral traits we can see that both echinoderms and chordates have true tissues. Uh, number two, bilateral symmetry falls into chordata, but pentaradial symmetry falls into echinoderms. Uh, number three, they both have organ systems. Number four, they're coelomates, which means they have a true coelom uh, that's from a digestive tube. 
Number five, they're triploblastic, which means they have three distinct cell layers in development. And number six, they have a complete digestive tract. Now there's one new derived trait that's shared with chordates, just being a deuterostome. And we'll discuss what deuterostomes are in the next slide. Let's take a look off to our right. Take a look at our diagram here. Again, let's start at the bottom of our animal kingdom. We have an ancestral colonial coanoflagellate. And then we look, we have parazoa. They don't have true tissues, that's the sponges. Eumatozoa that have the true tissues. And then that's split into two groups, radiata and bilateria. Radiata has radial symmetry and they're diploblastic, and those are the jellies and comb jellies. And bilateria has two groups, acylamates, which no body cavity like the platyhelminths, and ones that have body cavities, and those are split into two groups. The pseudocelamates, they have a body cavity, but it's not enclosed by a mesoderm, and those are the rotifers, the nematodes. And then the true coelomates. Those are ones that have body cavity enclosed by a mesoderm. And then we have protostomes, the locophorates, and the deuterostomes. And again, to remind you, the dashed line means we're not sure exactly where those phyla fit into this phylogenetic tree. The protostomes, they have a coelom that comes from cell masses, and those are the mollusks, annelids, and arthropods. And then on to our last group, the deuterostomes. They have a coelom from a digestive tube. Those are the echinoderms and chordates. The two major lineages of coelomate animals differ in embryonic development. The deuterostomes, the taxonomic term deuterostomia, comes from the Greek word second mouth, are a superphylum of animals. Deuterostomes are distinguished by their embryonic development. In deuterostomes, the first opening, the blastopore, becomes the anus, while in protostomes, it becomes the mouth. In both deuterostomes and protostomes, a zygote first develops into a hollow ball called the blastula. In deuterostomes, the early divisions occur parallel or perpendicular to the polar axis. This is called radial cleavage. It also occurs in certain protostomes, such as the locophorates. Most deuterostomes display intermediate cleavage, in which the developmental fate of the cells in the developing embryo are not determined by the identity of the parent cell. Thus, if the first four cells are separated, each cell is capable of forming a complete small larva. And if the cell is removed from the blastula, and other cells will compensate. So let's take a look at our diagram. We can see two groups, the protostomes, which are the mollusks, annelids, and arthropods. We see deuterostomes, which are the archonoderms, and the chorates. And we see to the left our fate of our blastopore. Well, if we take a look at the diagrams, the protostomes, uh, you see the digestive tube, the mouth develops from the blastopore. And then to the right, the deuterostomes is reversed, the anus develops from the blastopore. All right, let's discuss the natural history of phylum Echinodermata. The habitat, they live on the ocean floor ranging from the intertidal zone to deep sea floors. We find them in the abyssal plains and sometimes we find them even down in the trenches in the ocean, several miles down. They have a water vascular system. Echinoderms lack gills and a circulatory system. Uh, alternatively, they use a water vascular system. Echinoderms, the coelom forms the water vascular system as a series of canals through the body which are filled with fluid and distribute dissolved gases, minerals, and sugars throughout the otherwise unvascularized bodies. The system functions secondarily in locomotion. The system compromises a central ring called the hydrocele and radial ambularca stretching along the body or arms. As well as assisting the distribution of nutrients through the animal, the system is most obviously expressed in the tube feet of most echinoderms. And tube feet are extensions of the water vascular system on which poke through small holes in the skeleton and can be extended or contracted by the redistribution of fluid between the foot and the internal sac. All right, let's discuss this for a moment. This is a hydraulic system using water to contract a foot with typically a sucker on the end. 
Uh, examples in the crinoids, the tube feet waft food particles captured on the radial limbs toward the central mouth. In the asteroids, or sea stars, the same wafting motion is employed to move the animal across the ground. Sea urchins use their feet to prevent the larvae of encrusting organisms from settling on their surfaces. Potential settlers are often moved into the urchin's mouth and eaten. Some burrowing sea stars poke their tube feet through the surface of the sand or mud above them into the water column and use them to attain oxygen from the water column. So they arose around 540 million years ago in the Cambrian period. Uh, we spoke that they are marine bottom dwellers. We talked about an endoskeleton. And they can autotomize limbs, which means you can cut off a sea star's partial of their foot or arm, and they'll grow it back. Their pentaradial symmetry, but keep in mind the larvae are bilateral, which is shared with that in chordates. And we talked about the water vascular system, coelom, that forms a series of water-filled canals that transports gases and nutrients, and movement by muscles of contracting against hydrostatic pressure. So, um, our muscles in vertebrates move against bones to move lever systems. Well, since they don't have the same type of lever systems, they will fill their hydrostatic system with enough pressure to make sacks very hard, like filling a leather balloon with an incredible amount of pressure and it becomes a very hard thing, somewhat like a football, but filled with water. And of course we talked about tube feet, which are used in locomotion and filter feeding. Now let's take a look at some classes in the motto. We have the Asteroidea, which is the sea stars. We don't call them starfish because they are not fish. Uh, they are active predators, so that means they will move around their environment searching for their prey. And they typically eat bivalves, such as clams, gastropods, such as snails and slugs, and corals. They have five stout arms lined with short spines, but some of the asteroidians have more than five arms. And not used in locomotion, typically, the tube feet are the main movers of the organism. Those are adapted for slow movement and predation, and for smelling. They also have chemoreceptors on their tube feet. They can sense chemicals around their environment. Um, and you can imagine with as that many sensors of smell, they can hone in uh, very well on their prey. They have dermal gills, gills that they extend off the skin and aid in gas exchange. They have pedicellaria which are microscopic jaws surrounding the spines. And those aid in defense, especially at small organisms that would try to make their home on them. And ambulacral grooves, which is an opening along the bottom of the arms for the tube feet to emerge. So we can take a look at our bottom left picture. And there's the pedicellaria. We can see that uh, there's the expanded view of a single jaw. And you put two together and they make kind of like a mandible in a jaw. And there's a video on dermal gills below that. Be sure to take a look at that. And if you take a look at our bottom right picture, we can see a sea star that's opening a clam to eat the meat inside. And it takes quite a bit of time, but how they work is all they have to do is open a small portion of the clam. And then they have a stomach that comes out their mouth. It's everted and goes in to the inside of the shells and digests the clam inside of its own shell. Taking a further look at the internal anatomy of Asteroidea, this will prep you for your dissection. What I'm going to do is start on the tips of the arms and work my way in. At the bottom, we can see a label of tube feet and you can see the tube feet run in columns or rows all the way to the tip of the arm. Now the tube feet are only a little bit of that hydraulic system 
looking at that bottom right diagram, we can see the tube feet are connected to ampulla, and there are many nerves, like the radial nerve, that control the tube feet's locomotion. Now, how water flows is through this pore called the madreporite, we can see in the top right, and that is transported to the ring canal, and then the ring canal transports water to the radial canal, which goes to the ampulla and then into the tube feet. But the ampulla are surrounded by muscles, as you can see in the bottom left, that contract and squeeze water into the tube feet, thus giving locomotion. In the right arm, we can see gonads extend into an arm. Arms are fairly voluminous, so organs fit inside there, and they're not just around the central disc. In the top right, we can see that madreporite. And along the epidermis, we can see spines and dermal gills. And those are the microscopic gills that allow for respiration. Uh, if we look to the left bottom arm, we can see the digestive glands that secrete digestive enzymes into the stomach, which can be averted. Now, going to the center of the sea star, we can see the stomach and the anus. And the anus will poke out the top, and the mouth is on the bottom. It's uh, a little backwards from what we're used to in the chordate world. The Ophiuroidians, again the brittle stars, or sometimes referred to as the serpent stars, have a somewhat similar lifestyle as the Asteroidians. However, we find more diversity in their arms. Many live in deep waters, so most of them uh, are around 1,600 feet below sea level, or 1,600 feet deep in the ocean. Uh, some of them are predators, some of them are filter feeders, and some of them scavenge dead organic matter. And here is where the tube feet come into play for filter feeders. They use them to collect particles in the water. Most are nocturnal, and one would find them under rocks during the day. Again, uh, they have slender snake-like arms that are very flexible for quick movement and stacked ossicles. They have closed ambulacral grooves, so they have no opening under their arms for tube feet. Instead, the tube feet project out of pores all over their arms. And we see those tube feet emerge between ossicles and with the asteroidians, they sense light and odors, and they can capture food particles because they're coated with mucus. In the top right picture, we see two different species of Ophiuroidians. We can see one that doesn't have many projections coming out of its arm that's very smooth and tan and black. And then the bottom one has many projections coming out of its arms typically for filter feeding. And then in the bottom picture we can see one with very long tube feet projecting from its arms to collect food within the water. If you'd like to see one in the aquarium on the second floor of the biology building, we do have a few brittle stars. The best time to see them is early in the morning or late at night. Further looking at class Crinoidea, we've noted that they are the most ancient of all echinoderms. They arose somewhere around 540 million years ago. They typically live from shallow to deep water, and as we mentioned, sea lilies can move around those habitats. Up to 6,000 meters down, we can find them in the abyssal plains and into the deepest trenches, such as the Mariana Trench. They have a mouth and an anus, but both of them are on top and they have a U-shaped gut. So you can imagine if you have both your mouth and your anus on top, then the gut will be U-shaped. 
Why is that adaptive? These echinoderms spend most of their time resting on a substrate. If they excreted waste at the end of their stalks, then they would be forming a little pile of excrement beneath themselves. Thus, they have evolved a U-shaped gut, which allows excretion of waste between their arms and the arboreal surface. Uh, what this is for is they use their feather-like arms to wave a current and blast their excretion into the water column. They are filter feeders, so they take particulates in the water and they trap them with their tiny tube feet and their arms. And then the arms are licked clean by the mouth. So the mouth is very delicate and the arms and the tube feet fit quite nicely in it and then the arm can move and slide the tube feet through the mouth thus collecting food. They have stacked ossicles which form the arms and the stalk and then those arms are divided into pinules these are pinnate branches much like feathers that trap the food particles. How the food particles get trapped are much like the brittle stars those tube feet and pinules are coated in mucus, which makes them sticky. If we look at the top right picture, we can see two distinct parts called the crown and the stalk, and the stalk is held to the substrate via a holdfast, much like kelp. And then we can see the columnal, and then we can see a boral cup, and the arms, and a pinule, and then the mouth is in the center along with the anus. In the bottom right picture, we can see a close-up picture of the pinules, and again, those are covered in mu mucus to trap food. Taking a look at crinoid anatomy, we can compare sea lilies and feather stars. Take a look to the right, they both have a crown. However, the crown for the feather star is used for filter feeding and swimming, whereas the sea lily, it's mostly for filter feeding. They both have a calyx, they both have arms with pinules, but the sea lily has a distinct stalk, whereas the feather star does not. And then on the bottom of the feather star, there are appendages called ciri, which are legs for perching on rocks. And those arms, for both of them, branch from five main joints. If we take a look at our bottom left diagram, we can see those five main joints. One, two, three, four, five. Now, coming from those arms, we see the pinules at the top there. Moving to the right, we can see there are two distinct plates, deltoid plates and small peripheral plates. And keep in mind that those plates do move to control the arms and control the mouth, which we can see the mouth is in the center, and then the anal cone is in the side, the periphery to the mouth, and then we can see the ambulacral grooves, as we saw in the asteroidians. Do they have pantoradial symmetry? By looking at the central disk, of course they do. It's evident there. And keep in mind that the anus and the mouth are on the boral surface, but they are not so close together that it would be feeding on its own excretion. And keep in mind there's always a temporal displacement between time to excrete and time to feed. So when it's excreting, it has a completely different rhythmic motion of its arms to propel the excretion away. And then when it's eating, it's pulling in food into the mouth. Further looking at classic hynoidea, the sand dollars and sea urchins again, obviously see that they're different than the asteroidians, the serpent stars, and the crinoids because they lack arms. They're typically round or flat and round. They have a dome-like structure that's called a test and that's made by the fusion of ossicles. And then the movement of the animal is much like the asteroidians, where they have tube feet, and tube feet protrude through holes in the test in very specific arrangements. Um, we can see pictures of those off to the top right and the bottom left. They have jointed spines, so the spines actually do move, and it's used for writing itself if they're overturned, or to protect against predators, they can direct those spines. And, of course, they have teeth. There are five ossified plates. 
They come from an organ called the Aristotle's Lantern, which is the bottom right picture. And they use those teeth to scrape off algae or eat prey. The Aristotle's Lantern is a collection of bone-like structures, or calcium carbonate structures, many muscles, and a hydraulic system that all work in synchrony to move the teeth in such a way that it allows the animal to scrape off food or capture prey. The two middle pictures at the bottom, we have a sand dollar at the top, and then the bottom picture is of a sea urchin that has been despined. You may find these on the beach, uh, typically without their spines, because their spines at the joints are soft tissue and degrade quicker than the hard tissue. Looking at the sea urchin test, we can see, of course, the ossicles are fused into a sphere with holes, and those pores are where the protruding tube feet come from. We can see they have an aboral surface, which means ab-oral, or lacking the mouth, which is where the anus is, and they have a madreporite at the top, and then at the bottom we can see they have the oral surface. We can see those tube feet coming out in those very specific rows and columns, and then spines also arranged in very particular rows and columns, and they're intermixed, of course, we have many spines and many tube feet. The spines can break off quite easily, but are regenerated quickly. I just ate a bunch of pizza, and I want you guys to know, I cut my pizza into five very big slices, and I made myself an aboral surface to remind myself of what we're studying. I just thought you should know that. The holothrodians we can see are clearly different. First of all, they're soft-bodied. They don't have the same type of ossicle structures we find in asteroidians or serpent stars. They have a lot of collagen. And collagen is interesting because it's densely packed but can be disconnected at will. What this allows is extension or distension of the animal to fit in very small places like rock crevices. They don't have very many spines. Most are spineless but occasionally you'll find a species that is partially or fully covered in spines, such as the top right picture and the bottom right picture. They have feeding tentacles. In the top right picture we can see that starry blue structure coming out from the animal. Those are covered in mucus to trap plankton and detritus, and the food is scraped off by the arms uh, into the mouth, so it's licked clean. And they have pentaradial symmetry, uh, but that's because it's less obvious to you guys because the body axis is oriented horizontally. And their defense, we talked about the sticky tubules that come from the cloaca and those entangled predators, and they have a lethal chemical discharge. Another defense that holothrodians have is to expel uh, a huge amount of their intestine. Their intestine will come out the anus, and a predator will choose to eat that rather than the organism and the sea cucumber will slowly crawl away using its tube feet. You'll have to forgive any grumbling noises coming from the background. That would be Mr. Pippins that is barking or guffing at a dog that is outside the window. For those of you who don't know, guffing sounds like boof. Further looking at sea cucumber anatomy, we see the same structures we define in the rest of the classes of a kind of dermata. Taking a look at the left diagram, uh, the top we see the mouth, and around the mouth we find modified two feet that are tentacles, and then at the base of that we find the ring canal. Again, these are hydraulically operated, much like the asteroidians. They have a calcareous ring, we can see the gonads there, we have a very long uh, sinus intestine and we have something called a respiratory tree. The respiratory tree extracts oxygen from the water in a pair of trees that branch off the cloaca just inside the anus, so that they breathe by drawing in water through the anus and then expelling it. The trees consist of a series of narrow tubules branching from a common duct and lie on either side of the digestive tract. Gas exchange occurs across the thin walls of the tubules to and from the fluid of the main body cavity. You can see that we have an anus, that is on the, quote, bottom, 
and of course a rectum, and take a look at that intestine. That intestine is very convoluted and sinus. We can see um, that the overall shape, if we make the organism upright, is similar to that of a sea urchin or asteroidian. However, they typically lie on their side. Okay, Pip. Are you ready? <coughs> Welcome back, Biology 182 Lab students. We'll be discussing Lab 40B, as in boy, on page 447 in your lab manual. Phylum Chordata. Taking a look at the first slide, we see many faces we recognize. Tiger, panda, loon, dolphin, chameleon, polar bear, hummingbird, parrotfish, zebra, elephant, great white shark, Jane Goodall and her chimpanzee. But there are some maybe you're not familiar with. Organisms with tentacles coming out of their, what appears to be a head. Organisms that are long with large round mouths with many teeth. An organism that looks like a sponge and a little organism that's in the substrate of shells that looks like a lance. We'll be taking a look at those organisms in detail. Your objectives for your test are, number one, what are the characteristic traits of chordates? Which of these are derived? In other words, what makes a chordate a chordate? And which of those traits are derived? Number two, what are the traits that distinguish the three subphyla in phylum chordata and the six classes of vertebrates? Each subphyla has their own traits that make them unique and each class in the subphylum vertebrata have traits that make them unique. Three, how are chordates adapted to obtain energy and defend themselves? Number four, what traits lead to increased intelligence? This is a major question in the animal kingdom. How is it that humans and chimpanzees have intelligence? What traits contribute to that? Number five, what ancestral traits do chordates share with echinoderms and hemichordates, which you studied in the previous lab? I'm going to go ahead and read this slide and then give you some notes in between and some notes at the end. The last phylum of deuterostome animals to evolve are the chordates which likely first arose in the early Cambrian, 520 million years ago. However, the fossil record is poor. This is because those animals were soft-bodied and didn't leave anything behind to fossilize well. They are either vertebrates or one of several closely related invertebrates. They are united by having, at least in the embryo phase, a notochord, a hollow dorsal nerve cord, pharyngeal gill slits, and a post-anal tail. And yes, even you, in development, had a notochord, a hollow dorsal nerve cord, which we still possess. We did at one time have pharyngeal slits and a post-anal tail. The phylum consists of three subphyla. Eurochordata, also known as the tunicates, or sea squirts. Cephalochordata, which means head cord, those are the lancelets, and vertebrata. Tunicate larvae have both a notochord and a nerve cord, which are lost in adulthood. They go through a metamorphosis. Adult lancelets have a notochord and nerve cord, but no brain or special sensory organs. Vertebrates are the only subphylum whose members have skulls, and all but hagfish, classic natha, develop a spinal column, which protects the dorsal nerve cord. Chordates have evolved from a diverse set of feeding methods ranging from filter feeding to predation. The development of increased cephalization, skulls, larger brains, and social behavior contributed to the evolution of increased intelligence in many vertebrates. Intelligence, as it seems throughout evolutionary history, has arose multiple times. I'm certain there were many dinosaurs that had some intelligence before 65 million years ago. Phylogeny. The current consensus is that chordates are monophyletic, meaning that chordata contains all and only the descendants of a single common ancestor, which itself is a chordate. Vertebrates consensus states that vertebrates nearest relatives are the cephalochordates, 
Due to the poor fossil record of earliest chordates, only molecular phylogenetics, a genetic analysis, offers a reasonable prospect of dating the emergence of this phylum. However, the most primitive group, the tunicates, are dated by a confirmed fossil to have arose at least by the early Cambrian, 520 to 525 million years ago. The last major lineage of animals we'll be discussing, obviously, are the chordates. But we need to put the chordates in perspective with a phylogenetic tree to understand where the traits derive to make a chordate. The ancestral traits that chordates possess are one, true tissues, groups of cells that perform very similar functions. Number two, bilateral symmetry, which means we can slice a chordate into roughly equal left and right halves. Three, organ systems, so tissues, when you have groups of tissues together we make organs, and then we have organ systems that accomplish a similar goal or task for the organism. Four, they're coelomates, they have a true coelom. Five, they're triploblastic, so in development they have three distinct layers of cells, and six, a complete digestive tract a mouth to an anus, a tube within a tube. Ancestral traits shared with hemichordates are dorsal nerve cord and pharyngeal slits. Hemichordates are not shown in this phylogeny, but evidence suggests that they are more closely related to echinoderms than chordates. Nonetheless, the chordates share a dorsal nerve cord and pharyngeal slits with hemichordates. Let's take a look at our phylogenetic tree here. Let's start from the beginning, work our way up so we understand where we are. So at the bottom we can see an ancestral colonial coanoflagellate, which gave rise to two groups, the parazoans, so no true tissues, those would be the sponges, or sponge-like creatures, and eumetazoa that have true tissues. And the eumetazoan gave rise to two groups, the radiata and bilateria, Radiata are obviously radial symmetry, and they're diploblastic. They have two cell layers in development, and bilateria has three cell layers and is triploblast. Bilateria gave rise to acelomates that have no body cavity, such as the flatworms, the platyhelminths, and the organisms that had true body cavities. And there are two groups of those, and the pseudocelomates body cavity not enclosed by a mesoderm, those are the rotifers and nematodes, and then the coelomates that have a body cavity enclosed by a mesoderm. And if you notice the dashed line there, that means we're not sure where that phyla fits into the phylogenetic tree. We're guessing somewhere there, but we're not entirely sure. The fossil evidence is spotty. And then out of the coelomates, we have the protostomes, the locophorates, and deuterostomes. With the locophorates, we're not sure again where they fit into the coelomate evolution, but we're sure the protostomes, the mollusks, annelids, uh, crabs, and insects, are different than the deuterostomes. That's a coelom derived from a digestive tube. So it's all about that coelom derivation, cell masses versus digestive tube. We have echinoderms and chordates are deuterostomes, but what differentiates echinoderms and chordates? Characteristic chordate traits we see in the embryonic phase of development are number one, a dorsal hollow nerve cord. The placement of this nerve cord is what makes it unique. It's on the dorsal side. There are many insects and other invertebrates that have a ventral nerve cord. And in vertebrates, this is what becomes the brain and spinal cord. Number two, a notochord. And that is a flexible cartilaginous rod that offers support. Many muscle attachments are on the notochord and used to contract with. And in vertebrates, this becomes the backbone. Number three, pharyngeal gill slits. Those are openings along the throat region 
four, and uricordates, which are the tunicates, cephalochordates, which are the lancelets and ignatha, which are the lampreys and hagfish, that's for filter feeding. They draw in water and filter it. In classes chondrichthys, which is a vertebrate and are also known as sharks, rays, skates, and osteichthys, which are the bony fish, is for gas exchange, as you know them as gills. And in all other classes, we see them lost in the adult. However, in humans and many other vertebrates, although lost, those tissues did develop into an organ and in human beings. It is the auditory canal that connects our throat to our middle ear and is used for balancing our middle ear air pressure with the atmospheric air pressure as it changes over the course of a day. And you'll notice this when you go up and down in elevation. Number four, a post-anal tail. It's often present only in the embryonic stage, and yes, you too had a post-anal tail in development. Remember, adults retain some, all, or none of these traits, depending on the class. Now let's go over the phylum of chordata and the subphylum. In the invertebrate subphyla, we have uricordates, those are the sea squirts and the tunicates, and the cephalochordates are lancelets. Remember, they have a notochord either in development or into adulthood, but they do not have a backbone. Now, the vertebrates are the subphylum of chordates that have a backbone, but the word backbone is deceiving. For in Ignatha and Chondrichthys, this backbone is actually cartilage, but is developed much like a bony structure, uh, but made out of different material. Osteichthys are the bony fish, and they do have true bone. Amphibia, which are our frogs, toads, and salamanders, and we're forgetting the Sicilians. No, not a person from Sicily. Class Reptilia, which are the turtle, snakes, and lizards, and of course our crocodilians. The aves, which are the birds, and the mammals. The subphylum Eurocordata has roughly 3,000 species. The tunicate is a carbohydrate-rich covering around the body, hence tunicates. They're a subphylum of sac-like filter feeders with an incurrent and a current siphon. They are now considered the closest relatives to vertebrates having dethroned the lancelets from that position. As with other chordates, tunicates possess a notochord during their early stages of development. The motile larval stages have the appearance of a tadpole, whereas the adult stage has a bear-like sessile or sedentary form. They feed by filtering seawater through the pharynx with their gill slits. Most tunicates are hermaphroditic. The eggs are kept inside their body until they hatch, while sperm is released into the water where it fertilizes other individuals when brought in with incoming water. Tunicates are suspension feeders. They have two openings in their body cavity, an incurrent and excurrent siphon. The incurrent siphon is used to intake food and water, and the excurrent siphon expels waste and water. The tunicate's primary food source is plankton. The, tunic the tunicate's pharynx is covered by a miniature hairs called ciliated cells, which allow their consumed plankton to pass down through the esophagus. Their guts are U-shaped, and their anuses empty directly to the outside environment. Tunicates are also the only animals able to create cellulose, which is a carbohydrate and seen in plants. The larval stage ends when the tunicate finds a suitable rock to cement itself in place. The larval form is not capable of feeding and is only a dispersal mechanism. Many physical changes occur to the tunicate's body, one of the most interesting being previously used to control movement. From this comes the saying, 
The sea squirt eats its own brain. Once grown, adults develop a thick covering, called a tunic, to protect their barrel-shaped bodies from enemies, parasites, parasites, and pathogens. Sea squirts are more closely related to fish, birds, and people than worms, sea stars, or other invertebrates. A note on invasive species over the past few years, Eurochordates, notably of the genre Didemnum and Stylo, have been invading coastal waters in many countries and are spreading quickly. These mat-like organisms can smother other sea life, have very few natural predators, and are causing much concern. Transportation of invasive tunicates is usually in the ballast water or on the hulls of ships. Current research indicates that many tunicates, previously thought to be indigenous to Europe and the Americas, are in fact invaders. Some of these invasions have occurred over centuries or even millennia ago. In some areas, tunicates are proving to be a major nuisance in aquaculture operations such as salmon farming. Examining the adult and larval form of Eurocordata with tunicates, we can see there are some similarities and differences, which leads us to a question. What's the advantage of a free-swimming larval stage? Well, a free-swimming larval stage allows for dispersal, which is similar to nadarians alternating between a sessile and modal stage. But the larvae here, having their notochord, postanal tail, dorsal hollow nerve cord, and pharynx with slits, allows more movement axes than nadarians. Nadarians going up and down the vertical axis of the water column, whereas these larvae can navigate through all three axes to find a suitable substrate for the adult. We can see that the larvae has a dorsal hollow nerve cord, notochord, postanal tail, and pharynx with slits, which are the four characters that we see in chordates. But the adult only retains the pharynx with numerous slits. We can see that in the larvae, the mouth becomes, in the adult, the incurrent siphon. And the larva has a stomach that becomes a stomach in the adult. And intestine that becomes the intestine in the adult. And the atrium, and we see that also in the excurrent siphon. And then we have what's called an atriopore which becomes that extra ex-current siphon opening. Recent research of gene sequences suggests that tunicates, not lancelets, are the closest living relative to vertebrates. This contrasts with the long-held hypothesis based on the number of chordate traits retained in the adult form, which is greater in lancelets for than tunicates. This is a great example of the unreliability of morphology in revealing evolutionary relationships between groups. Feel free to take a look at those videos to help you understand more about the difference between adult and larvae tunicates. Examining the subphylum cephalochordata are the lancelets, a group of primitive chordates. They're usually found buried in the sand in shallow parts of temperate or tropical seas. In Asia, they are harvested commercially for food that is eaten by both humans and domesticated animals. They are an important object of study in zoology as they provide indications about the origins of vertebrates. Lancelets serve as an intriguing comparison point for tracing how vertebrates have evolved and adapted. Although lancelets split from vertebrates more than 520 million years ago, their genomes hold clues about the evolution, particularly how vertebrates have employed old genes for new functions. They are regarded as similar to the archetypal vertebrate form, but recent genome research suggests that tunicates, again, uh, lancelets are the closest living relatives to vertebrates. The physical features. Lancelets grow to about uh, 5 to 8 centimeters at the longest. That's 2 to 4 inches. In common with other vertebrates, lancelets have a nerve cord running along the back, pharyngeal gill slits, and a tail that runs past the anus. Also like vertebrates, the muscles are arranged in blocks called myomeres. The notochord, unlike the vertebrates, the dorsal nerve cord is not protected by bone, but the simple notochord made up of a cylinder of cells that are closely packed to form a toughened rod. The lancelet notochord, unlike the vertebrate spine, extends into the head, giving them their name. The lancelets also have orotentacles that hang in front of the mouth, 
and act as sensory devices and as a filter for water passing into the body. The water exits the body via the atrial pore. Taking a look at lancelet anatomy, we can see they have oral tentacles that capture food and then bring it into the mouth and pharyngeal gill slits that trap those, that food with mucus and then cilia are what move the food to the intestine. They have an atrium, atriopore, which is not the anus. The atriopore is used to pump water out. The segmental muscles notice their arrangement around the notochord, using the notochord as a stiffened rod for muscle attachment. And again, we see the tail that's past the anus, dorsal hollow nerve cord, and notochord. On to the subphylum vertebrata. We will be discussing seven classes of fish through mammals. And we, as humans, are in that group. And we can see that we have a brain, spinal cord, and all of our four major characteristics of chordata in development. This group originated about 525 million years ago during the Cambrian explosion, which saw the rise of organism diversity. But the notochord develops into a vertebral column, which protects the spinal cord. And the notochord becomes intervertebral discs, or cartilage discs, in between each vertebrae. We have a dorsal hollow nerve cord, a central nervous system, and the skull increases intelligence, protecting the eyes, ears, and brain. The first known vertebrate is believed to be the Mylocumenia. Unlike other fauna that dominated the Cambrian, early groups had the basic vertebrate body, a notochord, rudimentary vertebrae, and a well-defined head and tail. All of these early vertebrates lacked jaws in the common sense and relied on filter feeding close to the seabed. The skull is thought to have facilitated the development of intelligence as it protects vital organs such as the brain, the eyes, and the ears. The protection of these organs is also thought to have positively influenced the development of high responsiveness to the environment often found in vertebrates. Other traits that unite all vertebrates are brain, closed circulation, and a heart. Now we have basically in our primitive heart an atria that receives blood from the body and ventricles that send blood to the body. A two-chambered heart, an agnatha and fishes, and a single circuit of blood flow. Blood is pumped from the ventricle to gills via arteries, and blood vessels that carry blood away from the heart. After picking up O2 and expelling CO2, the blood returns to the atrium via veins, and blood vessels carry blood to the heart. There is no segregation of oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor blood in the heart. The three-chambered heart, we see in amphibians, blood returning from the body, and the lungs is mixed in a single ventricle, less efficient than the four-chambered heart. And we see those in birds, in mammals, and crocodilians are the two streams of blood flow that separate oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Other things are the urinary system with two kidneys, a complete digestive system from mouth to anus, and a cloaca and that's an exit for digestive and urinary waste reproductive opening. We don't see the cloaca in mammals. Further looking at classic Nantha, we can see lampreys and hagfish. Lampreys, there's about 50 species of freshwater jawless fishes that attach to hosts using its oral disc with horny teeth and burrow whole uh, using its radula at the same time secreting enzymes that can break down the scales of fish. The hagfish are commonly known as slime eels because they can rapidly convert water to slime, which they excrete as a defense that suffocates predators by clogging their gills. And there's a cartilaginous endoskeleton that's made of chondroitin, but not bone. And then they do have a notochord, again, that's made of chondroitin. It's a flexible rod, and it's a primitive backbone where muscles attach, and it protects the dorsal hollow nerve cord. What's interesting about hagfish, as you can see on some videos of them, is a hagfish will tie themselves in a 
granny knot and slide that knot down their body along with the mucus they excrete from their body makes it nearly impossible to hang on to them with your hand or a predator to hang on to them with their mouth. Continuing on with class chondrichthys, there are about 850 species in this class and sharks are the most threatened by overfishing and being caught in fishing nets. They're large marine predators or scavengers. They have the first true jaw in our phylum and some of those jaws are some of the most powerful of any known vertebrate. They have a cartilaginous endoskeleton. They have paired appendages, fins, a lateral line system. So those are canals within the skin that are lined with sense receptors, which sense pressure changes in the water flowing through these canals. If you look, look closely at the skin of these fish, you'll see tiny pores, which are openings to the lateral line canals. They have a heterocircle tail, which means it has curvature to it. They do not possess a swim bladder, which osteichthys, the bony fish, have a swim bladder that fills with air or gas and then can be deflated to control buoyancy. Instead, sharks, skates, and rays rely on very large livers that secrete oil. And this oil, of course, is less dense than water, and that is how they control their buoyancy and vertical position in the water column. And they do not possess an operculum, which is a gill cover that bony fish have to protect their gills. Some sharks must swim constantly to get O2 from the water and maintain their vertical position, but other sharks have developed unique ways of pumping water through their mouth. They have gills, and it varies how many slits they have. Some are seven, some are five. They have denticles. Their scales are shaped like little teeth and are very rough to the touch. And many sharks have internal fertilization and live birth, and some lay eggs. Osteichthys, um, as we mentioned, are the most diverse group of vertebrates. Over half of all described vertebrates are bony fish. And they have a few derived traits. A bony skeleton, which muscles attach and for protection. I do not want you students to think that cartilage is any less of a material. Sharks, skates, and rays are capable of locomotion as fast or faster than many osteichthys. Uh, bony fish have an operculum. It's a gill covering uh, that protects the delicate tissues of the gills and swim bladders that fill with gas and can deflate and inflate controlling buoyancy going up and down in the water column without much muscle effort. Um, ancestral traits are jaws, of course, lateral line, and paired fins. We can see the lateral lines there on that very large striped bass. And off to the right, we see a salmon with a slim bladder. And there's a video there on fish ecology. On to class amphibia, which are frogs, salamanders, toads, and Sicilians. Not a person from Sicily, as you can see, the spelling is different. Salamanders and newts are probably the most uh, ancestral group of amphibians resembling the early tetrapods. There are only about 500 species of salamanders and newts, while frogs and toads comprise the bulk of radiation with the largest lineage over 5,000 species. Salamanders and newts, the larvae have gills, but otherwise resemble adults. Sicilians look like worms, but are actually amphibians that inhabit the wet tropical regions of South America, Africa, and Southeast Asia in rainforests. They make up one of three orders of amphibians, alongside frogs and salamanders. They lack limbs, but possess a retractable sensory tentacle. S uh, Sicilians, with the exception of a few aquatic species, have a burrowing lifestyle into fossorial habitats. The skin of one African species is fat and nutrient-rich, so larvae peel the skin off the parent and eat it. That's a new job for parenthood. Here, eat my skin. Um, amphibians are ectothermic, so their temperature should be close to matching the outside temperature wherever they are. Um, their life cycle, as we know from our childhood experiences, 
Females will lay eggs in water and, and frogs and toads. Um, they'll have males secreting sperm over the eggs um, and external fertilization. However, many uh, amphibians have internal fertilization as well. They have aquatic larvae, and we call those in frogs and toads uh, tadpoles, but in salamanders and sicilians, we do not call them tadpoles, call them larvae. And tadpoles have a mouth, and they feed. They can be predators, they can be um, herbivores, and then they metamorphose into the adults. And adults are carnivores, and typically insectivores. Um, they breathe with permeable skin, so the skin is highly vascular, and frogs, Sicilians and salamanders, have uh, mucus-covered skin, which is uh, very susceptible for intaking uh, pollutants. Um, but there are many uh, frogs that secrete through their skin a toxin, such as the poison dart frog, at the top picture there. We see below that a marine toad, and off to the right an egg mass of an aneurin, and below that in the bottom picture is the Sicilian, since they live a fossorial lifestyle, they have reduced eyes. And typically in the amphibian world, if you see a brightly colored species, they can be poisonous or nauseous to predators or be mimicking one of those species. Moving away now from the amphibians and into the amniotes, how did they become more adapted to dry land? And this includes the reptiles, crocodilians, birds, and mammals. This happened about 135 million years ago in the early Carboniferous period. A lineage of vertebrates branched from the amphibians and evolved many adaptations that had enabled the life cycle of the resulting group, which are reptiles, to become completely independent of water. Uh, remember that amphibians have to return to water to breed. How are the five traits of all amniotes adaptive to life and habitats away from water? Well, the watertight eggs allow for embryos to develop out of water. Internal fertilization eliminates the necessity of water for sperm to swim to the eggs, such as in frogs and toads, and allow the eggs to be carried and thus protected by the female. And sex uh, is internal and is much more direct than amphibians. How does the amniotic egg provide an adaptive advantage? to life on land. Embryos can now develop outside of water because the amniotic egg is watertight. Embryos won't dry out, however, they still allow gas exchange. Embryos are protected from bacterial and fungal infection and small predators inside a hard shell and because it is round, is very hard to crack in certain applications of force. Different regions within the egg compartmentalize waste, nutrients, air, and the embryo itself. Looking at that egg diagram, how do you think the amniotic egg provides shock absorption? Take a look at the albumin. It surrounds the entire embryo and the yolk uh, in a gelatinous pad. And if we see the chorion, chorion is for gas exchange, which is easily going through the shell. And then, of course, we have lots of amniotic fluid on the inside to keep the little embryo in cased in fluid. Again, uh, the more adapted dry land traits are watertight eggs, internal fertilization, eyelids to protect the desiccation from eyes, keratin-rich skin to be able to waterproof the skin, and efficient pair of kidneys. Looking at class reptilia, which cover snakes, turtle, lizards, crocodilians, and dinosaurs. You see that they're the first class independent from water for their whole life cycle. Um, we can see their pictures here, up to the right. In the top left picture is our own gopher snake from Arizona. The top right we have a Jackson's chameleon, and on its horns we have a dwarf chameleon. In the bottom left we have a sea turtle on the bottom right, we have a green anole from Georgia and the Carolinas. 
their internal fertilization means that the male and female must put their cloaca together and directly uh, put the male gametes into the female. Um, they have a watertight amniotic egg, which we know. Um, they do have eyelids, except for snakes. Snakes have a covering over their eyes, which is a clear scale, kind of like goggles. They have watertight skin and very protective hard scales. They're ectothermic, which again, like the amphibians, the body temperature is the environmental temperature. However, as with amphibians and reptiles, they display a high degree of thermoregulation via behavior, so they can use a cool spot and a hot spot to keep their temperature in between someplace. And, of course, they communicate, as amphibians do, that a knoll at the bottom right is using his dewlap to show off his dominance. Chameleons in the top right, uh, there's a video called Rainbow Defense you should take a look at. And then snakes uh, display some color change, but for the most part that is a lizard phenomena. Um, and of course, those color change and behaviors with communication can also be used for mating displays. The degree of parental care seen in amphibians and reptiles typically is low. However, with crocodilians, um, it is known that the females will make a mound and then wait for the eggs to hatch and the little babies will crawl out of the mound and they will sit near her or in her mouth sometimes and she will monitor them uh, until they're of an age where they're not as vulnerable. Moving on to the class aves, birds, um, there's over 8,000 species described globally, 900 species in North America. Hollow bones is one of the traits that birds have. They have air cavities inside of those bones, which make them lightweight. For example, an adult bald eagle with a wingspan over five and a half feet weighs less than 14 pounds. They exhibit a great deal of parental care. Eggs are ectothermic, so they need a parent to provide warmth while the embryos develop. And parents also feed hatchlings until they can fly. They have complex social behaviors. So we know the peacock exhibits uh, a very complex behavior to attract a meat. And uh, they have increased intelligence. As we know, many parrots, like the African gray parrot, uh, show a great deal of problem solving. And there are three videos there. They've got two videos on intelligence of birds and then a video on gray parrots. Be sure to look at those. And then we have three videos on the social behaviors of birds. Um, the diagram to the bottom right um, is about the finches of the Galapagos Islands. Uh, there are now at least 13 species of finches on the Galapagos Islands, each filling a different niche on different islands, and thereby reducing competition for food among species. All of them evolved from one ancestral species. Uh, which colonized the islands only a few million years ago. This is this process, whereby species evolve rapidly to exploit empty e ego space, is known as adaptive radiation. The ecological niches exert the natural selection pressures that push the populations in various directions. On various islands, finch species have become more adapted for different diets, uh, seeds, insects, flowers, and uh, blood of seabirds and leaves. And on that, the evolution along with their diet, uh, they have various different beak shapes and functions. Uh, we can see a warbler finch has a long tweezer-like bill to be able to poke into holes inside of a tree and pull insects out. We have the woodpecker finch. It's able to drill a hole or make a hole into bark and also use a tool to poke into beetle grubs uh, we have a small insectivorous tree finch, again, a bill that's designed for catching insects and trees. 
Um, and then we have a vegetarian tree finch that eats seeds and fruits. An interesting question um, in the evolution of birds is, how did flight evolve? Well, of course, the forelimbs and their morphology evolved uh, into wings. So what are the major adaptations in birds that enable them to fly? What do you suppose were present in the winged dinosaurs like Archaeopteryx? Feathers are modified scales and reflect the evolutionary origin of birds from reptiles. Um, the now we're talking they have endothermy, which they can maintain a body temperature, which means that they use energy to regulate their body temperature. Notably, birds are the only extant living animals with feathers. The structure of feathers have branch structure consisting of a main shaft from which barbs pinnately branch, like a leaf, from which barbules pinnately branch, from where hooks branch. Um, when birds preen, they are reconnecting the hooks to nearby barbules to return the integrity to the feather. So the feather hooks into the feather adjacent to it, making a superstructure of feathers. Forelimbs are modified into wings. And what happened to the palm of the forelimb and what happened to the fingers? Well, we can see in our diagram there, there is a palm and there are fingers still, but they have shifted instead of using for grasping now to modulate the shape of the wing to accommodate for different currents of air thus flight. Now onto the diversity of mammals. Although morphologically diverse from whales to beavers to giraffes, lions, manatees, tarsiers, giant anteaters, and three-toed sloths, uh, the smallest vertebrate class with only 4,000 species that have been described. However, occasionally in a rainforest, one or two species every decade will be discovered. Like birds, uh, we are endothermic. We're the only animals to have fur or hair, and those are modifications of scales across the evolution of mammals from lizard-like ancestor. Hair enables these animals to use less energy to maintain their core body temperature, critical and cold habitats. However, some of these mammals wear clothes, such as humans and dogs for that reason. Mammals are also the only animals to produce fatty tissue, adipose tissue, which helps maintain their core body temperatures. We use mammary glands that produce milk, hence our name, to nourish young. And we're the only animals to have sweat glands. Um, although mammals have a four-chambered heart, their circulatory systems are nowhere near, nowhere near as efficient as that of birds. Uh, the dentition, uh, which birds lack teeth, um, mammals evolve several different types of teeth, specializing each group of mammals for a different diet. We have larger brains. Uh, we have a neocortex, a brain region that is unique to mammals. The central mammals have a corpus callosum, unlike monotremes and marsupials. It's a structure in the brain that connects left and right halves. The size and number of cortical areas, or Brodmann's areas, is at least in monotremes about 8 to 10, and most in placentals up to 50. The six-layer neocortex has been found in the brains of all mammals, but not in any other animals. In birds, there are clear examples of cognitive processes that are thought to be neocortical in nature, despite the, la the lack of a distinctive six-layer neocortical structure. In a similar manner, reptiles and turtles have primary sensory cortices. A consistent alternative name has yet to be agreed upon. In intelligent mammals, such as primates, the cerebrum is relatively large to the rest of the brain. Intelligence itself is not easy to define, but indications of intelligence include the ability to learn matched with behavioral flexibility and problem solving. Be sure to check out many of the videos we have here on cetaceans, which are large oceanic mammals, such there as the orca. We've got one on the manatee, little primate called the tarsier, and um, also on the three-toed sloth, and then also about intelligence of the mammalian brain. What are the lineages of mammals? Well, there are three groups. There are monotremes, such as the spiny echidna and the platypus, 
Um, they lay eggs and out hatch a mammal. They lack nipples, but they have milk glands on their belly. There are marsupials that have very short gestation, uh, and like kangaroos, and so they'll have live birth of a fetus, which we call a joey and a kangaroo, and it's very small, and it's in the pouch, and feeds on a nipple within the pouch as the joey matures. And then placental mammals. We have longer gestation, which is more than a month, and in some cases can be up to almost two years. And we nourish the young uh, in the placenta with the mother's blood, and then with milk glands after they're born. Be sure to check out the Kangaroo Joey video. It's a quite a cute film. What threatens mammals globally? Well, in the wildlife trade, hunting for the illegal wildlife trade has the greatest potential to do maximum harm in minimal time and has a serious threat to a number of endangered and vulnerable species. Illegal wildlife trade and contraband include live pets, hunting trophies, fashion accessories, cultural artifacts, ingredients for traditional medicines, and wild meat for human consumption. Bushmeat trade was considered illegal when imports occur in contravention of the Washington Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species of Fauna and Flora sites. National quarantine laws and other laws that ban the trade of specific animals. Illegal wildlife trade is broadly defined as an environmental crime which directly harms the environment. Wildlife trafficking is driven by organized groups who exploit natural resources, endanger threatened species and ecosystems in contravention of sites. Environmental crimes, by their very nature, are transboundary using porous boundaries and involve cross-border criminal syndicates characterized by irregular migration, money laundering, corruption, and the exploitation of disadvantaged communi communities. The links between wealth, poverty, and engagement in the wildlife trade are complex. People involved in the trade are not necessarily poor and the poor who are involved do not capture the majority of the trade's monetary value. In 2002, the illegal wildlife trade was estimated to be the second largest illegal trade, second only to the drugs trade, with a value of at least 10 billion pounds in English pounds. In 2008, it was estimated that it is worth at least US 5 billion and may potentially totally, total excess of 20 billion dollars annually. This ranks the illegal wildlife trade as among the most lucrative illicit economies in the world, behind illegal drugs and possibly human trafficking and arms trafficking. Due to its clandestine nature, the illegal trade was difficult to quantify with any accuracy. Potential areas of market growth include the internet, where traders use chat rooms and auction websites to engage in illicit wildlife sales. Poaching is another threat. There have been many national and international actions taken against certain kinds of poaching. Hunting for ivory was banned in 1989, but the poaching of elephant continues in many parts of Africa, stricken by economic decline. The Philippines has more than 400 endangered animals, all of which are legal, illegal to poach. The bushmeat trade initially referred to the hunting of wild animals in the West and Central Africa. A more worldwide term is game. The term bushmeat crisis tends to be used to describe unsustainable hunting of often endangered wildlife in the West and Central Africa and the humid tropics, depending on interpretation. African hunting predates recorded history. By the 21st century, it had become an international issue. Many conservation organizations have come together to address bushmeat crisis, though the formation of Bushmeat Crisis Task Force, whose mission is to build public, professional, and government constituency aimed at identifying and supporting solutions that effectively respond to Bushmeat Crisis in Africa and around the world. Logging concessions have operated by European and Malaysian companies in African forests have closely linked to the Bushmeat trade because they provide roads, trucks, and other access to remote forests. They are primary means for the transportation of hunters and meat between forests and urban centers. And of course, climate change. Um, a gradual increase in the warmth of the region will lead to earlier flowering and fruiting times, driving a change in the timing of life cycles of dependent organisms. Conversely, cold will cause plant biocycles to lag. Larger or faster, more radical changes, however, may result in vegetation stress, rapid plant loss, and desertification in certain circumstances. An example of this occurred during the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse, an extinction event 300 million years ago. 
At the time, the vast rainforests covered the equatorial region of Europe and America. Climate change devastated the tropical rainforests, abruptly fragmenting the habitat into isolated islands and causing the extinction of many plant and animal species. Satellite data is available in recent decades and indicates that global terrestrial net primary production increased 6% from 1982 to 1999, with the largest portion of that increase in tropical ecosystems, then decreased by 1% from 2000 to 2009. There's a couple of more videos there on the pet trade and climate change if you're interested. Last words, valuing the diversity of life. The last word in ignorance is the man who says of an animal or plant, what good is it? If the land mechanism as a whole is good, then every part is good, whether we understand it or not. If the biota in the course of eons has built something we like but do not understand, then who but a fool would discard the seemingly useless parts? To keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. All the Leopold. Thanks for listening, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your semester. Good luck on your test. Find a reason. Hope you'd find a way.